Hey, what is going on, everybody? This is V3Cast, episode 14. How's everybody doing tonight? I'm on location Good, in man. Florida. What's up with you guys? <laughs> I'm on location I'm not... in Detroit. Oh, yeah. the woods, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> I'm in on vacation, not in Florida. That's right. In your house with the brand new flooring. So enjoy, man. Flooring, <laughs> flooring, yes. <laughs> the things you get the things you get excited about as an adult. That's right, yeah, man. Seriously. Pretty sad. Pretty that sad. stuff, uh, you know, it's it's all about being comfortable that in is. your house. So and that's a big deal. And being responsible. It's all that's about right. right. That's right. Heck yeah, man. So uh what are you guys up to? What's new? I got my Amana Marth uh obituary carcass tickets today. That's what's new for me. Bam. Oh, nice, man. Nice. I'm going to that for sure. I'm yeah. definitely going to go to that. That's How much I'm... were those? It wasn't bad. I mean, uh, you know, for State Theater main floor, it was like 35, 39, and then the service charges. So compared to, you know, what people are paying nowadays for for concert tickets, though, that's like more like old school. You know, it's pretty decent. Yeah, that's not too bad, actually, for sure. Because you know, you're not, we're not going to. Only St. Andrews will charge like twenty dollars still today, you know. Right. But uh, we can't expect that from everywhere. Yeah, the state theater right, production is too big for that uh, low of a price. There's a lot, yeah. lot more going on. Yeah, Greg, you'll be there too. Greg, you're I'll going, have right? to get. I'll probably have to scoop one up. I got to look at the date though. You know, I'm an, a responsible adult. I mm-hmm. got to look at my calendar. I cleared my. I cleared it. <laughs> Greg might be getting new flooring again during that concert. No, time. no, I'm done with <laughs> I'm done with that. Oh, no man. more, no more awesome. chaos in this house. Right on. Well, hey, um, before we get into our fun topics for this episode, I got to know what y'all are drinking. Uh, Greg, we'll start with you, man. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take a drink of it. Not giving it away. Oh, he's got that in a fancy. Is that a pint glass? It is. It's big. Yeah, 16 ounces. Okay. So here's what I'm drinking tonight. I'm oh, lean it yeah. Back. You Suicide. see that? That's awesome. Dig Is it. That- yeah. Suicide Machines did a collaboration with Drew Detroit. I and didn't know it's they called- did that. Yeah, man. Hey, I'm the drink hawk. You That's know I'm right. on the cutting I edge. Know. Greg has everyone yeah. all locked down. He knows yeah. what's coming out, what's already out. Dude, yeah, you shouldn't, so- you- you shouldn't be surprised, Steve, that you didn't know that, and he did. <laughs> right, I know. That's just going. That's, exa- right. that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. So it's called. It's called, and I'm. I'm going to try to pronounce this right. It's called Gabo Gomi, and uh, it's a Japanese. It's a Japanese phrase that uh, Rich told me means puke trash. Right. And uh, I guess Brew, De- Brew Detroit wasn't all that thrilled with the idea of calling one of their beers puke trash. But I, um, the way Rich tells the story, it's like an inside it's an inside joke sort of within the band. Gotcha. Uh, they had they had flown 12 hours to Japan. And because so basically so basically Rich and Justin were staying up all night drinking because it was daytime in America. So like they're clocks were almost like a complete half day off right. so they were up all night drinking and that's when they came up with it so right. and then uh it sort of is a tie-in with um you know this new this new thing they got coming out in fact i think like their new single comes out friday it's called slipping into darkness so it's all tied in together you know remember that we can't voyager 3 came real close to a, a beer tie-in and right that's uh that's on our list of things to accomplish aaron that's right we'll do that. We're gonna and, do and, that. and speaking of that i'm definitely going to be tuning into spotify on friday to, to crank that song up that's got that's awesome i also didn't know about that so I, i'm learning stuff left and right tonight very good. yeah this is this is a blonde ale so it's not an ipa it's a departure for me but uh oh, it's, it's really good so if you like blonde ales it's a perfect summer beer I like Suicide Machine, so I'll check it out. There you go. Yeah. Did you hear me drop names in there? I was I dropping did. names, Aaron. How, Man, how could yeah. you not? How could you my not? Fr- my friends in the Suicide Machine. Yes. Maybe you've heard of them. <laughs> we happen to know most of the guys in the Suicide Machines. I mean, you know yeah. them all. 
And if you ever played Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, you know who we're talking about. Man, and uh, Rich and I were just talking uh, bass gear at your birthday party, Greg. Uh, I, I, I was telling him about the uh, this sweet bass overdrive pedal called uh, the Alpha Omega that I picked up a couple years ago, and I was telling him I loved it. And uh, he wants to try one of those out. And he also wants to try out, like, now Dark Glass just makes a whole amp, a whole head, which I've never tried, but he he's trying nice. to get his hands on one. So so that's what I'm drinking. Gabo Gomi. Go find it. Drink Hawk yes. Commands. <laughs> Aaron, what you got, man? The good old is- Shiner Bach. Shiner Bach from Shiner, Texas. It's a great beer. It's got like that's a, a new one for Aaron. Yeah, I mean, it's one of my favorite beers, though. Um, it's got it looks this, like it's dark. It's kind of dark. It's got this nice, rich kind of caramel, a little bit of a caramel edge to it. Um, but it's not sweet. It just has that a bit of a bit of that feel. Is and there coffee really in there, Aaron? No, thank God. There's no coffee in here. I bet you there's coffee or chocolate in there. No, hell no. I bet you it's both great though. Of them. And the the uh, it's got the, one of the coolest logos. Look at that. Look at that. It's a Ram, right? Right, right. Look at that. Can't beat it. For sure. China Tech. Yeah, I right think on. that's a Ram. Well, yeah. check it out, fellas. As you know, I'm on vacation. So when I'm on vacation, I have two drinks. <laughs> so I got. Uh, Gosling ginger beer, ice cold, yeah. and my oh, look at that world famous white monster. White monster, <laughs> yes. I knew it would be back. I knew oh, it. <laughs> are you drinking them both at the same time, or are you going to drink them uh, con- contiguously? Uh, yes, contiguously. So, can, can, I, I also no. have a cigar, I, I have a quorum con- cigar currently. Oh, go ahead. And as I'm uh, as I'm enjoying this uh, quorum cigar, I'm going to have first the ginger beer. And then switch over to the monster so we can keep Thanks. the energy level rocking during Rock. this V3 cast. <laughs> is it uh, continu- con- contiguous or is it concurrent? <laughs> That's a good I question. Know. I'd have to look that up to know for sure. I would be guessing. But in layman's terms, I'm going to drink one. Oh, yeah. And then when that's it, finished, I will drink the other. I remember. It's consecutive. That's what uh, it is. Yes, yes, yes. Uh... Because if, 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 when I watch the movies and they say, you will be serving these two life sentences concurrently, they mean at the same time. Right. But, there you go. But but the other one, what did I just say? Consecutive. Consecutive. consecutive that's one after another. Right. right? Yes. All like right. consecutive so, numbering in the printing world. Yes. Same thing. Yeah. Close that topic out. <laughs> right. <laughs> but that's cool, though. You brought back the white monster. It hasn't been here for a couple of weeks. That's right. Yeah, it's been it's been a minute. How dedicated is Steve to the podcast that he's doing it when he's on vacation? <laughs> oh, that's dedication, and man! I found my V three cast T shirt. There you go. You know where it was? It was in this old backpack that I took to California when I saw New York Ninja at the New Beverly, and apparently I never took like three T shirts out of that backpack. And yeah. then here it was, <laughs> waiting to be worn. It's like, go. hey, what took you so long? Yeah, that's why, and that's why Steve can't have wireless headphones. See, exactly right, exactly right. Oh, but you know what though, in a, in a cool tie-in, when you're watching this podcast right now at Voyager3Store.com, we have V3 shirts like this for sale. It's like a gray ring spun cotton, so it's the soft cotton with uh, direct to garment full color logo of the V3 cast logo. Go get you one. There you go. Steve, Steve's <laughs> always closing, man. Cigars are for closers, Steve. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Otherwise, they don't give you one. And I'd be like, where's my cigar? Right. <laughs> All right. Well, our first topic tonight that I thought would be fun is um, underdogs, unsung, underrated, needs to be out there more. Film, your favorite film and album that fall into that category. Um, there's probably going to be more than one, obviously, but for this particular episode, let's just pick one and uh, yeah. share it with the folks out there because some people might already know about it or some people might discover something brand new right now. Right. One, Greg. <laughs> yeah, I've yeah, got Greg. one. I've got, I was very strict. I have one of each. He has okay. one of each with three A couple mentions. runner-ups. A couple of <laughs> I I knew it. 
<laughs> I was very strict, and I chose one runner up for each. <laughs> That's great. All right. Well, I'm dying to know uh, what Aaron. What are yours, man? All right. Um, I did do a lot of thinking about this, and this is something that you could you could always come up with a bunch of them. Right. But for for my movie. Um, it's a movie that I've only met a few people who've seen or have heard of, but it's one of my top five movies of all time. It's called Brotherhood of the Wolf. Um, or if you're French, this is a, a French movie. It's called Le Pac de Loup, if that was uh, oh. decent French. Um, and it's a really great movie. It's, it's, it's about it's a, this mishmash of genres. It's a historical, based on actual historical fact about this beast, uh, the beast of Golvedon that was killing these women uh, in this village uh, way back in like, I don't know, the French revolution time. So it's based on a true, true story, but then they kind of go into this whole fantasy where this guy is sent to investigate and to kill the beast. He has this partner who, who is a native American and they just beat ass all over the countryside of France. They beat up all these bad guys they beat up the they beat up the beast they use martial arts so but this is a french movie you know a french period piece but there's martial arts there's horror there's all these different elements that they just in my in my eyes seamlessly combine and make this genre masterpiece uh hmm. this very pulpy um awesome movie um and the, i saw it in 2001 and it was it instantly jumped to one of my favorite movies of all and it only recently came out on Blu-ray. I had it on DVD for year, for 20 something years. And, um, it finally came out on Blu-ray. Um, I don't know, a few months ago, uh, half a year ago, something like wow, that. Wow. That was one and, of those ones that must've been like tied up in legality or something like yeah. that. Right? Yeah. And that's when I had given up hope. I was like, you know, I've been, I would search brotherhood of the wolf Blu-ray every few months and it was, it never went anywhere. Uh, and I just said, well, it's just never going to come out. Um, and then it finally did. And I was really, uh, really, really happy to see that. Um, yeah. My album is by a band called Huntress, who never, uh, I mean, they did pretty well, but they weren't around for very long. And they didn't get, you know, too crazy big. But uh, a band called Huntress, and their their first album debut is called Spell Eater. And uh, it came out, I believe, in uh, 09, if I remember right, maybe, maybe 11. I, I forget. But a little bit ago, more than 10 years ago. And um, it's a great uh, sort of classic metal with some thrash involved. Um, uh, there's Jill Janis who could hit every note from the highest to the lowest. She could growl, she could scream, she could sing clean, but she always had this bit of grit. And then the, the guitar work is, is awesome. Uh, everything about the band is great. And, but the, and they did three albums. Spell Eater was the best. It's a masterpiece to me. The other two... Were, were never lived up to Spell Eater, but they were still cool. And I luckily got to see them twice. Never a long set because they were always like in the earlier part of the bill. But I saw yeah. them at, at Mayhem Fest um, opening the day. It was like 10 o'clock in the morning. But, you wow. know, so the, only the diehard people who really knew Hunters or just the people who really wanted to get in there early for the whole show, the whole day uh, up at Pine Knob, uh, only those people saw them. And so they were amazing. And I saw them open for... Um, either Cradle of Filth or Demo Borgir uh, at the uh, Majestic a little bit later. Um, and I got to like meet them and stuff like that. So that was really cool. Um, so yeah. Uh, and then she she died a couple of years ago, a few years ago. She ended up killing herself because she was dealing with this crazy depression and, and uh, bipolar disorder. And that stuff is all written right in the lyrics. It's it's kind of eerie because you you can just see her saying all these things that are going on in her life the good the bad and and the ugly i guess and um and it, it was when i when i saw that she killed herself i was not surprised i was bummed as hell i still am but i was like one of the least surprising and also most depressing uh deaths that i saw you know in, in like the rock rock wow. uh, world so um but yeah but she at least left her mark and i think that it would be cooler if a lot more people knew about huntress because they were there there you know the 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 fire that burns twice as bright lasts half as long. So that right. was that. That was Huntress, and uh, it's amazing. Spell Eater, right on. Hey, can can I comment on yours before we go to anybody else's? Yeah, oh, and you too, Greg, of course. Um, but uh, Brotherhood of the Wolf, I'm fairly certain 
uh, back in like 2002 or 2003, we would do movie nights with our old buddy Dennis, who used to be in a rising uh, and, and other bands around Detroit. And uh, was that one that we watched at the movie night? I'm pretty sure it yeah. was. Yeah. Yep. Sure. Gotcha. I remember, <clears throat> I don't know if I just wasn't ready for it somehow, mm-hmm. because I remember being like, I didn't dislike it, but I was just like, eh. but you know, with time, I need to watch that again immediately. Cause I know that if you, ha- if you ha- hold it in such high esteem, that it's gotta be pretty kick-ass. So I, I gotta watch it again now with a different, you know, mindset, obviously uh, with that much time passed. Um, and then Huntress, you've talked about them before. And I think like when we're on the road, sometimes I think you played some of their albums. And I think somehow maybe one of them somehow liked Voyager 3 or something like that because their Twitter followed us back when the band was going on, which yeah. is pretty cool. I mean, you know, we're not yeah. big, you know, so it's when when a kick-ass band like that follows you, you're like, oh, nice, okay. Yeah. You know, we must be doing something right. right. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, I, I kind of paid attention to them as well, uh, you know, from your recommendation and hearing them and then the, the, that whole angle of uh, them following us like that. So that that's that's pretty sweet. And that is super sad and tragic that all, all that yeah. had to happen for sure. Yeah. But that that album is... There's a fire in that album because she had been around the scene for years trying to put music together, trying to put a band together and stuff. She had been in cover bands with like other um, other sort of well-known players. And, Were they uh, from L.A.? Yeah. And um, so you could hear you could you know, the passion, the hungriness that you they, you can see in somebody's usually it's going to be in their early work, you know, when they're struggling to get up there um, that that passion that they have built up that fire that exploded like crazy in spell eater and in the other two albums is not quite as as much but spell eater was like the culmination of probably every good idea she ever had lyrically vocally and riff wise like it just yeah. all came together so it's it's bombastic i'm gonna fire that album up soon as well yeah check it out greg how about you man well, yeah, I mean, Steve, you're completely wrong about Brotherhood of the Wolf. I remember seeing it the first time and thinking it was kick-ass. So Steve is wrong. The movie's awesome. <laughs> right. No, I just, it's, my mind wasn't right that night, I we, guess. Yeah. <laughs> no, he, no, Steve can be wrong. And, you know, Steve has grapes a lot of times. That's, we're not even going to explain, we're not even going to explain what that means. Just know no. that. <laughs> but if you start accusing him of having grapes, he might actually get grapes. So that's. Be careful. That's true. It's like a, a yin and a yang or a chicken yeah. and the egg thing somehow. Yeah. <laughs> and with with that movie, I remember watching it that movie night. If you don't know what to expect, it might hit you wrong. It might hit you like, what the hell's going on here? But I had already like when I saw it in the th- in the theater, you know, I w- I had seen the trailer and I was waiting for the movie. I saw it in the theater and there were like four people in there, you know. So it's it wasn't any kind of commercial success, and that guy, the director Christoph Gans, has only done a few movies after it, and that really sucked because I was he was like I was looking forward to seeing everything he did, and he's done very little since the early two thousands. He did Silent Hill though, which I think is also a great the movie. original one. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah, yeah, I like a good werewolf movie. Aaron. Yeah. Right All right, Greg, what are your picks, man? All right, so I've only got three or four of each. so let's try to get through these quick (laughs) all right no for my movie i'm going with runaway tom Selleck and gene simmons man yeah it's really poorly rated on rotten tomatoes and like most people talk shit about it and i don't know it just doesn't seem to get a lot of respect but like there's a bunch of things going for it that i like first of all it's gene simmons from kiss everybody knows my obsession with them it's also like sci-fi with like rogue robots, you know, killing yeah. people, which I think is cool. They had those little spiders, you know, that are super awesome. And then Jerry Goldsmith did the score. It's a great score. It's a 1984 movie, Aaron. Yeah. Magic, magic year. That's a great uh, year. You know, you can't miss. And yeah. it's, I don't know. So I had, I had the soundtrack on vinyl. I own the movie. It's just, it's one of my favorites. And I don't, you know, people talk crap about it, but, I don't know. I think it's great. So yeah. it's underrated for sure. Like people should watch that movie. If you like even remotely like sci-fi, you should watch it. Dig cool. it. 
it's I'm not do, Blade I'm Runner, you know what I mean? Too. Like it's not gonna it's not gonna reinvent sci-fi for you, but it's it's good, man. Yeah, I haven't seen it since I was a little kid, so I I'm due for a, a rewatch for sure. It's great. You won't be sorry. No. And then my record <laughs> my record is um by a band that's very well known. Like, well, I mean, I guess they're an alternative band. They're really well known and and I know like almost everybody that hears what album I pick is going to disagree with me, but um, it's the band Killing Joke and the album is Brighter Than a Thousand Suns. This is one of those records where, you know how it was when we were kids, you only had so much money to buy tapes or whatever. Right. So like this album just happened to be the one that I had. You know, I had heard of Killing Joke and I probably just bought it because I, I heard Killing Joke was cool and, you know, that was the one that was out, so I bought it. Um, but you know, it wasn't until later when I sort of listened to more Killing Joke that I realized like what a departure this record is sort of for them. You know, it's really like, I kind of, you know, liken it to like Depeche Mode almost, you know, it's like really, really polished and really like, um, more commercial, would you say? Yeah, yeah, I guess, but like not just not as heavy Mm -hmm. as some of their other stuff, you know, like, I guess they're considered sort of like a, you know, post-punk band or something like that. And they have like a harder edge on almost all of their other records. But this one in particular is just really, you know, not much different than like Depeche Mode and not much heavier, you know? Mm. So I don't know, man. I just, there's something about his voice and the way the songs are. And, you know, I, at that point, wasn't invested in Killing Joke. So for me, I just thought that's what Killing Joke sounded like. Right. But like, yeah, and like I said, no I didn't really... Right. So I didn't know until later that, you know, they actually were quite different <laughs> than yeah, this particular yeah. record. But this is the one for me, man. So mm-hmm. like if you like Killing Joke at all and you've already heard it and you hate it, then let us know in the comments. But uh I know that's that uh, Prong considers Killing Joke a, a, a big influence to their sound. So that's also well, a nice uh leg up or thumbs up or an endorsement, if you will, you know. Big time. Pro- I mean, I probably actually, not this record though. Maybe not <laughs> probably that, right, right. But when I when I finally got around to listening to Killing Joke, and because of Greg, he played them for us, and I was like, "Oh, wait a minute here! What have I been missing? They're amazing! They're awesome! And not only are they great, not only are they pioneers, but I mean, I can hear not just an influence on Prong. Prong was just taking parts from Killing Joke and and recycling them. I didn't know that at the time. I thought nobody else sounded like Prong when I first heard them, but Prong was definitely hard on their sleeve borrowing from killing joke and i'm not even saying that as a bad thing but i hear killing joke some of their riffs and i'm like well i think i've heard that on a prong album uh, you know, <laughs> and 12 yeah. years later it's amazing that's, it's the, awesome. that's the other thing that's cool about i think the guy the, the main guy's name is Chaz something but uh that's what's cool about him is like he doesn't and and they as a band don't really care sort of where they fit. You know, they've been described as new wave or post-punk or synth pop or gothic, you know, like there's all these things that people call them. Right. Yeah. And, and it's just because he doesn't, you know, they, they don't go into a record, you know, trying to sound a certain way. It's just what, however it comes out, I think, you know, right. so I sort of like that about them too. You know, you don't get the same record over and over again, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Big those it, are my big. picks, and I've only got two, one of each. Oh, man, those are Sticking good to picks, the rules, man. man. Those are good. You did it. Yeah. All right, I have one. Uh, my film pick, when I tell you this one, I'm not an expert on the film because I've only seen it one time, but I just loved it, and I, I want to watch it again soon. And luckily, it is available on most of the streaming platforms out there. But uh, the, the, um, the uh, 1997 film called Cube, uh, it's, it, it was a Canadian production, and uh, it didn't come out in the States uh, until a, a year later, believe it or not. It, it came out September 9th, 1997 in Canada, and then it came out in the United States on um, September 11th, uh, 1998. Super creative movie and did a lot with a little, because basically, um, I don't want to give anything away of it. Uh, plus, I've only seen it once, so I don't really know you know, everything about it by heart anyway, but it's basically like pretty much a one location film. So um, set a super small budget. I think it was like 350 or $250,000 budget. 
but it made like nine million dollars uh, on its release. So you know, studios love that. So there's been some sequels and prequels since then. But uh, the, and the guy who did the score, um, I wrote his name down, uh, Mark uh, Corvin, uh, did a really cool score for it. And then you would also know this composer's work from uh, The Witch and The Lighthouse. He's done higher profile films since then, but um, it's a sci-fi film uh, mixed with horror kind of like also like a dystopian future that is kind of weird and they don't tell you a lot about it but you kind of get the sense that you know things have gone very wrong in society um just a super cool movie creative did a lot with a little as i said uh very fun film so i recommend that to anybody who likes that kind of genre of films for sure and then yeah. uh my music pick you guys can probably guess this one because anytime I ever have a chance to sing the praises of uh, the band Handsome, I, I do it. So uh, their one and only full length album, uh, which came out February 4th, 1997 on Epic Sony, uh, was self-titled. And uh, it's it's uh, one of the best and most underrated rock records of the whole entire 90s, in my opinion. It, uh, it was kind of like a super group, basically. So you had... Uh, Peter Mengade, who was in Handsome, Tom Capone, who was in Quicksand, Pete Hines, who was in the Cro-Mags and Murphy's Law, uh, Jeremy Chatelain and uh, Eddie Nappy on bass. Uh, Jeremy was the singer. Really creative guitar work from the two guitar players. Um, uh, Peter had like always the most tasty riffs, um, catchy, but still heavy and not standard, like not what a guitarist would just plug in and play right away. It he he thought about it and he tilted it just a little bit or just did things to the riffs and the song structure to make it really interesting. Uh, and then Tom Capone's super creative kind of ear candy on top of all that. He did all kinds of cool stuff on, on pretty much every track. Uh, it's just slamming. It was produced by Terry Date, too, who did Pantera stuff and Deftones stuff and even some Slayer stuff, I think. Right. Um so the sonically, it, it just slams. It's, it's it's a really creative record in the production and the songwriting. Totally recommend the band Handsome to anybody who likes, you know, harder stuff, rock and roll or post punk. Those are my picks for film and album. Yeah, awesome. I mean, I Aaron, remember... I'm, I'm still trying to get you uh, on the Handsome train. Uh, I'll never stop. <laughs> I, I i i actually wish i liked them because you <laughs> so into them and always were that i felt like like is there something wrong with me that i'm missing the boat with these guys but i'm always willing to ch check it out again when we heard it at um jeff's party the other day it sounded better to me than it used to back you know 20 years ago yeah so I need to listen is the album on streaming yes it okay. sure is I'll, I'll, I'll give it a good listen and and be fair with it i mean I know the album already. It's not like I'm right. going to hear something I haven't heard, but I might hear it in a different way. Um, true, true. And, um, Cube, I remember seeing that probably at like three in the morning on the Sci Fi channel 20 years ago, no, more than 20 years ago, 25 years ago or something. And uh, just to give people an idea of the premise of it so they can just get a little taste. And some people have probably already heard of it, of course, but a person wakes up in a cell and they don't know why they're there. I don't even remember if they even know who they are at that moment or something, but they don't know where they are or why they're there. They just can't get out. And then at some point they, they open a box window and they see that there's another person in another cell adjacent to them. And basically there's all these people in this, in this cube and they right. don't know, you know, so. Yeah. Uh, so it, they try to piece together why people are there that, that you know, they have theories as to uh why who's there is there type of a thing and also they try to figure out what happens in each room and some people think that they know why certain things happen in in some of the rooms and some people are right some people are wrong etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's there's a lot going on it's layered uh story and, and and interesting characters it's it's very cool um and here's a here's another little cool tidbit that kind of uh it said that the film initially was inspired by the um the classic twilight zone episode uh five characters uh, in in search of an exit i'm yeah. sure people know that one it's a apps i mean every twilight zone is great but that one is one that stands out um and that one has a special 
um, spot for me as well, because um, it was probably about 10 years ago now or so. I directed a uh, Sponge video, the, the, the band Sponge, who happens to be from Detroit, and that the, they were also extremely big in the 90s. Um, and I did a video for one of their tracks called uh, Fade From View. And um, I kind of spoofed that Twilight Zone episode as well uh, in a totally different way. It wasn't like Cube whatsoever, but it was inspired from that episode. So uh, I have a, a sweet spot, you know, for that because I've loved that episode since the first time I saw it when I was a little kid, then used it for a music video inspiration. And then to find out that Cube was also inspired from that same episode. Pretty sweet. <laughs> for sure. Now, now Steve's dropping names. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, my my everybody's dropping sponge. names. Aaron, yeah. who else? Now, who do you know? <laughs> I, I know I know the guys in Sponge too because I helped. See, I was Steve's. Uh, basically, what is it called? Um, production assistant. Grip. Production you were assistant. the grip. Yeah, I was the grip. <laughs> I was the bus boy. I was the dolly. I did all that stuff. Uh, That's right. That, that was a great video too. Yeah, it was fun. Definitely fun. Um, but yeah, so a bunch of cool films and a bunch of cool albums. Check them out if you haven't heard of these. Um, we, we think you'll dig them for sure. And we think they need more attention. And let us know what your picks are for uh, on underrated movies and and, uh, and albums. But just keep it to one. That's right. Yeah. You got to follow the rules. And, yeah. <laughs> and you'll end up in the mailbag if you do yeah. that. That's right. You might end up in the mailbag. That's you right. might end up in the mailbag. Speaking of mailbag. <laughs> Mailbag. Yeah. Uh, today's mailbag is real, real short and sweet. We talked a lot about Star Wars last time because of uh, Obi Wan Kenobi, the series, and um, so we had some comments from uh, Joe Cady, our friend from uh, Among These Ashes and Finality. Um, great bands coming. They have shows coming up. He was saying that he didn't like the prequels, like pretty much like we don't except for episode three. Um, and he said, but he really did love uh, the clone wars and rebels. And he was commenting on the sort of way they had to shape their narrative because they were kind of being, well, they had been pre-shaped by the, the prequels. You know, you, you had to stick with what they did in the prequels and, and tell those further stories in clone wars and rebels. So that was a good point. Um, but people seem to, love those universally i don't know i don't know if i've heard anybody talk anything bad about uh clone wars and pre and uh and and rebels um and we just keep hearing all this great stuff about those shows right and we're definitely going to watch them it's going to take a while because clone wars went for like eight years or, or more i don't know nine years so it's going to take a while to get through it but we will watch it and so about in in 20 years from now we'll have our big recap <laughs> um, right Oh, yeah, on, podca it's about on time, podcast guys. 1013 right. we'll, and, we'll cover that and at the same time cam floyd said that he thinks that all star wars after 1983 is crap which is, is also kind of a good point you know everybody <laughs> would have been i mean and i i love some of these new movies uh i'm way more forgiving but here's the thing here's a universal truth everyone would have been happy if they had stopped in 1983 we all right. wanted more. We all wanted more, but we didn't think we'd get more. We had heard rumors about a thing called a prequel, but we didn't think it would actually ever happen. And we waited for like more than, I don't know, 15 years. We would have been perfectly fine if they hadn't done any more movies. We could have had our books. We could have had our comic books and video games and take those or leave them. You know, some of those books were great. Some of those comics were great. Right. Uh, but um, there wouldn't have been anyone unhappy today. Uh, they would just be wanting more, but that's a different thing than unsatisfied or pissed off about story decisions. Uh, it would have just been like, oh, wouldn't it have been great if they'd done more Star Wars? But we would all have been happy with what they did a hundred years ago uh, in the original trilogy. So, right. um, yeah, so that was just that was the mailbag. It was a lot of stuff about um, about Star Wars. And uh, I just wanted to bring those two things up. So. All right, we have some Voyager 3 news to talk about. Uh, it's what we've been mentioning for the last few uh, episodes, but uh, it's still newsworthy and it's coming right up. So mark your calendars 
for Motor City Nightmares. It's July 29, 30, and 31, a three-day fest at the Sheraton Novi in the Metro Detroit area. And the Friday night after the um, fest ends at 10 o'clock, at 10.30, the after party starts. And uh, it is going to be Voyager 3 playing live, a live concert set with the Amino Acids opening up. It's going to be off the hook fun and there's going to be hopefully a lot of celebs there still and uh, just a party. It's it's great. We've done this before and we totally love everything about Motor City Nightmares. And we're going to be there during the days too, uh, Friday and Saturday with a table, a booth, if you will, um, signing merch, selling merch, hanging out, fist bumping and uh, drinking white monsters and other such things. Right, gentlemen? <laughs> no. No, the cool last part. Right, that's right. Greg's like, uh, no. (laughs) But uh, some highlights. I have some highlights, and Aaron also is going to bring you some highlights for this year's Motor City Nightmares. Most of the Dawn of the Dead cast, the original 1978 Dawn of the Dead, are going to be there. We have uh, Ken Foray, um, Galen Ross, Scott Reiniger, and Tom Savini are going to be there, confirmed guests. There's going to be photo ops at different times, so check motorcitynightmares.com for all the times you can sign up and buy your photo op they'll they'll be signing stuff this is not to be missed it's going to be so much fun all great vendors you're going to be able to find cool obscure shirts hats toys you know it goes on and on if you've ever been to these uh, horror conventions they're super super amount of fun I, I i encourage everybody to go check these out for sure along with uh the the dawn of the dead people we have some other guests from other movies and uh, you know, people people of the genres, of especially horror and science fiction, too. We got Nancy Loomis, who had the poor unfortunate of getting destroyed by Michael Myers in the original Halloween. <laughs> uh, we have the kid, I hope I say his name right, Dag Fairch, who was the young Michael Myers in Rob Zombie's Halloween. Oh, yeah. And he, yeah. Did, he did some other stuff, too. He was in Hancock. Um we have Alice Alice Krieg, who's a classic. She was in Ghost Story. She was the board queen in First Contact. And she was also in, like I said before, Christoph Gann's movie, Silent Hill. She was in that, too. Uh, and, and a ton of other stuff. A lot of great genre movies she's been in. And then on that the more an excellent recent, tie-in, man. God dang it, that's good. <laughs> uh, on a more recent note, we have Cooper uh, Andrews who's from Walking Dead. He's like that kind of big, kind of cuddly teddy bear guy with a beard who was um, who was uh, King uh, Ezekiel's right-hand man in Walking Dead. I stopped watching Walking Dead a few years ago, so I don't know if that dude's still alive or not, but uh, I don't know. Somebody maybe can tell us. I, I well, couldn't I mean, watch it. Before. He's going to be alive. He's going to be at the convention there. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Sometimes I get reality. That's a, that's a very good point. <laughs> that's a very good point. I get reality and fantasy mixed up sometimes. Uh, luckily, he is alive. And so is Nancy Loomis. She got, you know, she survived the filming of the movie. She that's just right. her character. Her character did. Um, and now she lives to tell you the tale. Yes. So come and see these people. Take a picture with them. You know, get them to sign your your poster of Halloween, old Halloween, new Halloween. And there's uh, how many Halloweens are there? There's some other people from different uh, Halloween movies. Like there's a guy from Fright Night. Oh, that that image of that lady in Fright Night with the mouth that's too big. Is still yeah. one of the scariest things I've ever seen. Um, right on. Anyway, uh, it's going to be a great time. We're going to be there. Friday night, we're going to be rocking and rolling, playing our synth rock up the ass. So, come <laughs> and, come and yeah, come hang out with us. That's come right. Hey, it's a long right. day. It's a long day sitting at that table. If That's we don't right. have people we know coming over to talk That's to us. That's right. Last but not least, this is one of the coolest things that we can report on. If you recall, um, one or two episodes ago, we introduced a contest a ticket giveaway it was a pair of weekend passes to motor city nightmares so we have a winner to announce um one of our uh friends and fans if you will uh who who we actually met um him uh three or four years ago when we were on tour with cybertronic spree when we played grand rapids um he came to the show and introduced himself um so the winner for the pair of tickets 
uh, weekend passes to uh, Motor City Nightmares is our buddy Tyler M. from Michigan. So congrats, Tyler. We'll see you at Motor City Nightmares. Thanks for entering the contest. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Good job. Our next topic is kind of different, um, but very important. You all know that sometimes life can get you down, problems arise, stress hits you, and so on and so forth. So we thought it might be cool to share three ways that we kind of chill out and find our inner Zen in life. And uh, maybe it might help you. You never know. We'll share them with you tonight. Uh, Aaron, how about you, buddy? Well, I think for all of us, one of the things is going to be pretty obvious. I'd I'd probably quit the band if all three of us didn't say music. (laughs) Um, It gets us through everything from when we were kids to now. And um, some people listen to music like to fit the mood they're in at the moment. So if they're feeling depressed, they might want to listen to depressing stuff. They might want to listen to The Cure for a few hours. If they're feeling hyped up or whatever, aggressive, they'll listen to Pantera or something. But for me, I listen to a lot of metal and it doesn't matter what mood I'm in. It always makes me happy. Like um, I listen to other stuff besides metal, too. But that's kind of my baseline. Uh, rock, rock and metal. I kind of throw all of that stuff in there because um, not only am I listening to the sound of the music, but I'm also listening to the production, thinking about how they got, you know, how they how they came up with these guitar tones or drum tones. I'm listening to the lyrics. I'm listening to the vocals and thinking about how clever they were when they wrote those lyrics to that song. That stuff takes me out of what's going on when I'm feeling, you know, pissed off or or down or whatever. And music, the other thing, great thing about it is you can take it wherever you go. So I don't care if I'm sitting in traffic and it's like, oh, we're not moving on the freeway. Who gives a fuck? Just turn the music up. I don't care. You know, other people might, I mean, I used to listen to Howard Stern in the morning all the time, but I don't like have access to that anymore. So, you know, um, music will, will make the time go by. It'll, it'll make every, every situation better. If you're waiting if in the secretary of state or DMV to renew your license and you're sitting there for two hours, who fucking cares? Bring some headphones and listen to music. It, you can listen to it in the house. We, I have music. I have access to music in every room of the house. I can listen to stuff, whether it's streaming or a CD or whatever. Um, every room in the house, the garage, the outside, all that stuff. So music is always there. Along with music, reading is super important to me. Uh, whether it's comic books or or books, I like to read a lot of science fiction. I like to read a lot of fantasy. I like to read a lot of um, war stuff, like Vietnam and World War II, especially. Um, so anything that will take me away from the regular life. I don't read any books about people just growing up and what it was like living, you know, growing up in a poor family or something in Baltimore. <laughs> I don't care about that stuff. I also don't watch movies like that. I like to see stuff that will take me away, that'll make that'll make some kind of escape. That's why science fiction and fantasy are so important to me. And a book you can also take with you all over the place, sitting in line at some place. If you know you're going to be in a lobby at some somewhere waiting for something, you can always bring a book. Can't read while you're driving, though. Don't do that. True. Um, That's but, all right. So uh, they have book on tape just for that you reason. Got books on tape. See, well, Steven, or, they're, they're not on tape anymore. But tape. you get my point. You okay, know what I, they know what you mean, Greg. <laughs> Calm down. Tape. No, I like don't know. What is it? What? Are you, what else do you call audio books? Audio books. Audio books. Yeah. What you got, Greg? So, like I said, my number one is the same as Aaron. So for us, I mean, for the three of us, and it's always been this way. Like, you know, music is not only like something that we listen to, but like. For me, it's it's really cathartic when when we get into a room and we like create something out of nothing. So I think what I'll I'll say that's maybe slightly different than what Aaron said is, you know, if we're talking about ways to like chill or you know improve your life or or you know be more zen, I would say find something in life that that um, appeals to you and that you're passionate about. It doesn't have to be playing synth progressive rock. You know, that just happens to be what we do. You know, it could be pottery. It could be, you know, you know, anything creative, some sort of creative outlet or some some sort of hobby that that you find interesting or like that you're passionate about. I would say 
devote some energy to it and try to become as good as you can at that, you know, and it gives you like a sense of purpose and accomplishment and things like that. And I mean, certainly with music, you know, none of us will ever know everything there is to know about our instruments. So it's kind of like this never ending journey, you know, it's like, yeah. okay, what, what can I do different this time that I haven't done before or whatever, you know? So always challenge, you know, that challenge of trying to do the next thing that you don't know or whatever is what keeps it interesting. So that's, that's the very lofty, you know, sense of purpose, <laughs> chill strategy, but like, right. you know, for, for me, it's like, I don't know, like when, once you get married and have kids, you know, it's like at the age my kids are at when they're finally in bed and you and your wife or whoever, you know, can sit down and just turn on, whatever it is you're watching at that time and, and devote some time to it. So like when it finally is like, okay, the kids are in bed, it's Friday night. We don't have to be up at six in the morning. You know, that, that to me is like, you know, also a Zen moment where, totally. you know, you know, we, we can totally watch two or three episodes of, of something if we want, you know? Yeah. And then the last one has to do with, you know, you guys were just over to my house recently, but like a, a big part of the reason that we like this house is because of our backyard. So like we have a tree line that runs through the back and my entire life, I used to go camping um, growing up. And when we walked into the backyard of this house, I was like, holy crap, it feels like I'm camping, you know, but like I'm in a subdivision. So like for me, like we, you know, I went out there and I built like sort of a makeshift, you know, uh, fire pit. So like in the summer, especially like just getting outside around the fire pit, you know, and, and relaxing in a camping chair and it's sort of just like every all the stress of the day just kind of like goes away you know when you're sitting out there with your family around a fire Dig so, yeah that's so th true that that's what i would say mine i think first and foremost is definitely the um the aspect of creating i've kind of built my life around that actually just like creating all kinds of different things for um us me um even my kids or any other work that comes along but uh the the project that you have in front of you whether it's to score a film or <clears throat> or to create some kind of a entertaining story or fun story to for someone to listen to or watch um it, it's that's definitely where uh, i think therapy comes in uh to it or, or or finding your chill or your zen type of a thing like uh i mean that's kind of why the, one of the main reasons I, I made my own studio is so that those tools are available anytime something comes up. Um, so uh, I always have all kinds of different things going on. So, you know, obviously Voyager 3 um, and I do solo music that's even more out there and weird. Um, and then I, I do videos with my kids. We do like little adventure uh, mini skits, if you will, that are, you know, produced fairly decently. I, I make music original music for each one of the, the episodes of uh of their stories and um stuff like that so uh that's i think something that we all share for sure um and then what to, to greg's point is uh not everybody is a musician so what greg was saying is great like find something some kind of activity that uh kind of takes you out of the situation that you're in or or, or things you're thinking about and uh, puts you in a different spot where you don't have to think about that or you're focused on a task or a project or a puzzle of figuring out this craft or or a skill. And uh, I think that ha has a large uh, potential to kind of get you out of a stressful situation. Um, and then some fun things that kind of like I've discovered or developed on my own, like what you said, Aaron, you have music in every area of the house and I, i'm the same way i i have digital stuff or you know on your phone or whatever i have vinyl i have cds um so i kind of have adopted some different uh things to do along with listening to each of those types of music like if i'm in the house and i'm listening to vinyl i'll brew up a great cup of coffee or or, or make like a, a an espresso drink that's always fun because it says you have different flavors of coffee or different types of coffees plus coffee in itself is an art you figure out how to brew it and what types of coffee you like and and you kind of get your mind into that whole thing and then that paired with a great record man that's awesome or what you're saying greg a good ipa with a um 
with a great album transports you. And a fun thing, as I'm, I'm on vacation right now, and one of the awesome things that I get to do on vacation sometimes is uh, if there's a pool, I recommend this to anybody, is if it's going to be raining, uh, of course, watch for lightning. Don't do it if there's, if there's lightning. A little disclaimer. Um, I love to float in a pool when it's raining because the rain is like really cold. And uh, the pool, especially in Florida, is usually pretty warm just by the nature of the beast. The sun's been pounding on it all day. So the, the pool is pretty warm and you get that cold rain. There's nothing like that. Um, so I always hope it's going to rain <laughs> whenever I'm, I'm going to be in the pool. And and uh, in this time of year in Florida, it usually rains once a day for about an hour. That's kind of standard. So we got to take advantage of that a couple of times. And it's just absolutely fantastic. And then in, in if I listen to music in the garage, I like to enjoy like a nice cigar or something like that. So there's all these different little things I kind of pair still though around music it's funny how how it always comes back to music <laughs> and yeah. i know that uh i mean a lot of people who would be listening to this podcast are probably either musicians or really like music or film um obviously so uh yeah that's some good uh definitely some good pointers to kind of help people find their zen we're gonna close out this episode of v3cast with something fun um We've obviously been musicians for many, many years, and we've all been in bands together since we've been playing music, basically. So along with that comes touring. And uh, back in the late 90s and early 2000s, we did a lot of touring. Um, so I thought it'd be fun if we all shared a a cool tour story. And now, of course, cool means whatever you want it to mean. So uh, just to share something interesting, funny, not funny, whatever it is, um, I guess... I'll go first on this one. Why not? Um, our old band Forge was on a West Coast tour. It was our very first time, I think, and only time we went out west, and uh, we played on the Sunset Strip on on one night. It was uh, a place called the Cat House, and we just went back when we went to the uh, was it the Black Cat. No, that was in Royal Oak. The Cat oh. House was in uh, was in uh, L.A. Right, it's kind so. of like a known place, like a lot of uh, people who like, like, for example, like a couple of the guys from Guns N' Roses, like the right before the tour would start or right after the tour ended, they would go there and have a jam session or something like that at, at, at the Cat House. So it was known for kind of cool stuff like that. But we played a show at the Cat House on one night and then we had another show in Huntington Beach the very next night and we didn't have a place to stay. So we, a lot of times, one of our missions was to try to find a, a fan that would let us crash at their house. That was always a mission that we would do. But on this particular occasion, that didn't happen. So we ended up uh, just saying, oh, hell with it. We're just going to uh, crash in the van. We'll find like a strip mall or something like that and park in the parking lot um, and, and sleep there and get an early start and head off to Huntington Beach the next day. So we found this little strip mall not too far from the Sunset Strip. And uh, we went to sleep. And uh, because we're not experienced West Coast people, we did not know that it's you know <laughs> super fucking hot in the in, during the daytime there because it's basically desert, right? So uh, when we woke up the next morning in the van, it was probably about 108 degrees in the van, and I thought I was gonna die. It was so hot, and I was so thirsty. I couldn't even. You can't even measure how incredibly hot and thirsty that I was. So I kind of staggered out of the van and I was looking for any place that would sell anything to drink. I don't care what it was. I just needed to have something to drink. So there was, and, and there was fresh black top on the parking lot at, at, at this uh, strip mall. So we were, we, we could have died, honestly. Um, did we, did we even crack the windows? No, open? I'll tell you oh. why we didn't do that because we didn't, we thought somebody would like, mess with us or something overnight or something like that or give somebody an opportunity to do bad stuff what i don't know why we didn't crack the windows but we did not so we were in this hot box <laughs> trying to kill ourselves basically so i staggered out of the van and found this like health food store it was the only thing that was open um so i i i meandered into this health food store and i'm like they're not gonna have anything for me to drink in here so i'm looking around and they had Believe it or not, I know this might sound crazy, but in my very young years, Aaron, our Aunt Judith 
would uh, juice carrots, if you recall, back back when she lived uh, in downtown Detroit at the, at the apartment <laughs> down there, the Park Sheldon. And huh. so I had carrot juice before in my <sighs> in my little kid ears. <laughs> so so I went in there and I bought this humongous ice cold carrot juice. It, probably, it was probably like, you know, that tall, like however big a big Gatorade bottle is, right? And I drank that thing in one tilt. I just downed this carrot juice. And it was the most delicious thing I had ever had in my whole life. And I think it saved my life. So I I, I was so, I, I just cherished this drink as I was drinking because it, it was so hot. And then, and then the clouds lifted and I felt like I was going to make it. And then sure, sure enough, we needed to do laundry really bad because we had been on the road for probably over a week at that point. And next door to the health food store was a laundromat. So we got to wash our clothes and I didn't die from heat stroke and it ended happily. But that was, that's my crazy kooky, one of many tour stories. <laughs> I, I, I don't remember, remember, I don't remember what you got to drink. <laughs> well, I was too stupid. And I remember you stumbling out looking like, you know, the incredible melting man. <laughs> and, uh, but I didn't, my cognitive function was still down here. <laughs> And I was just sitting in the in the van for longer. Bob and I didn't get up. I kind of noticed you and then just couldn't move. And I stayed in the hot ass van uh, for I, I don't know uh, uh, how much longer, you know, and, and you might have had to rescue us like get out of here. <laughs> right, right, right. I, I brought in some uh, some other healthy drink for you. <laughs> right. I love did that. that did, did that did, van not have air conditioning? It did because it was a brand new van. We just bought that van like two weeks before that tour. Yeah, but we couldn't have that thing engine running all night long with the air. That's correct. No, but you could turn it on like once you woke up and realized you were dying. We probably did that. I I mean, to our credit, we probably did. My cognitive function was down here. I couldn't think of that. And I love that you, you didn't just get a water, which is like the basic thing that humans need to function. You had to get a carriage juice. That's and, uh, great. Yeah, I was going to say, like, like ass that drink doesn't ever. sound refreshing. Oh, it was the best, though. Seriously, it was the best carriage juice to date <laughs> I've ever had in my life. <laughs> oh, man. Steve sort of mentioned our, our MO for um, for shows trying to find a place to crash. So along those lines, one of the shows we played, and, and I'm terrible with dates and, like, years and where we were. But I do seem to remember the experience. But uh, so we stayed at somebody's house and Steve can sleep in no matter what. But Aaron and I wake up and we're like, first, you know, we got to get coffee, you know. So like Aaron and I are up, we're drinking coffee. And I remember wherever we were, there were like this, there were these woods behind the subdivision or something. So. You know, one of the things Aaron's known for doing is like exploring whatever building we're playing in or, you know, woods that are nearby. (laughs) So we got up. Aaron convinces me, of course, you know, let's go, let's go walk around in the woods and see what's back there. So, you know, it's going to be another three, four hours before Steve gets up. (laughs) I'm like, we're, we're walking through these woods. And then like, we sort of stopped and realized that there were like about, I don't know, 30 deer in this yeah. clearing and we're like wow. where did all these deer come from like i don't even remember, like how did we not like scare them off right and and then there was like the male the male the main male deer like approached us and was like super mad because yeah. i don't i don't know he was getting like really aggressive and it's funny because i tell this story to a guy who's a hunter <laughs> and he relentlessly makes fun of me about this to this day <laughs> cuz he couldn't believe that like so Aaron and I are standing there. This male deer is getting really aggressive. He's like, I remember he's like pounding his hoof on the ground and snorting and like, yeah. you know, doing what Aaron's doing. He's like, you know, lurching at us. And Aaron and I remember, I remember Aaron and I are standing right next to each other. And we just kind of like barely turn our heads to see each other. And we're like, what's our move here? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it was reverse. <laughs> so so Aaron and I are like trying to figure out like what we can pick up to potentially hit this deer with, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, cause, uh, we didn't think it was going to end well, but I think, uh, all we did was make ourselves really big and yeah, got really loud and, 
they ran off I, the the main male deer backed off but yeah uh, for a minute there Aaron and I we weren't really we were underprepared we were at a loss and then we had to remember that you know for better or worse we're at the top of the food chain and we had to like <laughs> assert our dominance and we yeah we, like Greg said we made ourselves big and we just kind of got aggressive like fuck you man come at us <laughs> right, and, right and then they finally ran away but it took a second you know for the deer to kind of register like that we're I've no never seen, yeah i've never seen a deer act that way you always think that oh. deer like as soon as they get around the human they'll just run you know but this one was not running you i know? bet you there might have been like uh baby deer was, nearby or something like that yeah it had, well no i think it had to be like mating season or something like that i'm not sure but man yeah. it, i've never seen a deer act like that <laughs> Mine is a, the, the night that I almost killed the band. Um, I, I was driving on the way to New York. So we were going through Pennsylvania. And it's late as fuck at night, probably three in the morning. There's no lights on the road. Um, uh, up to the right is a, is a cliff going up a mountain. To the left is a cliff going down the mountain. Okay. So there's very little room margin for error error on this um, road. And there's no lights except brake lights off in the distance. All you can see is those two red brake lights. They You can sort of trance and go into the, where they look like the devil's eyes, you know, basically, because <laughs> they're just floating in the blackness and they look like the devil's little beady red eyes. Well, um you, I don't remember who was in the band at that point as far as drummers, but I don't think I, I don't think this, I don't think I was there. Even if I would you remember there, this, no, you wouldn't, you wouldn't because whoever was there was asleep. That's yes. part of the thing. <laughs> um, so everybody was asleep. To, to, we used to have this thing, uh, our old band van, um, had all of our equipment in the back, and then above it, we built this loft that was small, but it was big enough for two, two guys to sleep up there like dracula style and and, and uh, <laughs> not enough room to sleep well there was no safety things involved you know we didn't even put a net or any kind of barrier in front of this loft wide open it, it, wide open <laughs> so in in the case of a real bad situation those two guys up on top would torpedo out straight forward either through the windshield or right into the back of the head of the driver and the passenger and just become missiles. Luckily, it didn't come to that. So John, our, our old guitarist, was in the passenger seat. I'm driving. I was in a trance-like state. It's that scene from uh, National Lampoon's Vacation. <laughs> right, yes, right. Yeah. Where the whole car is asleep, and then they pan over to Chevy Chase, and he's asleep too. Right. <laughs> I, I thought I was in control of the situation, and I see the devil eyes far, far in front of me twisty turny windy mountain side road you know and i'm seeing those lights ahead of me and i'm in and out don't know exactly what's going on i think i think i'm okay all of a sudden i hear john go hey 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 hey, hey, hey. and i look <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm barreling down on this car i'm about four feet away from it because i didn't realize how close it was getting I'm barreling down on this car, about to hit it. I'm slamming on the brakes, trying to control everything and not go off the road, uh, trying to save everyone in the band and all of our thousands of dollars of equipment, and um, which is just as important. And, <laughs> and I, I somehow stop, you know. And I don't know if the person in the car noticed me or or anything. But they just kept driving, and I just, like, I backed up, backed up more and more. Let that be a and, sign that it might not have been quite as bad as you remembering it, but yeah. still traumatic nonetheless. Possibly, because nobody woke up in the back. The two guys in back didn't wake up, which is insane. Um, and John and I just looked at each other and said, okay, we got to get off the fucking road now. I, I have to go to sleep or, or switch or something like that. Right. So from then on, if you start getting tired, tap out and get somebody to take over. Or just even if you pull over on the side of the road, who, right. I don't know, forget the hotel, whatever, like just stop driving. Being right. being in a band is cool, guys. 
It is. <laughs> that the panic in John's voice though, it was the scariest thing I'd ever heard and the funniest shit I'd ever heard. Because it was <laughs> right. <laughs> he thought I was in control. And he's like, we're getting kind of close. And then he finally realizes that I'm not I'm not even there. So right, was, right. He is not stopping. <laughs> no. Holy moly. <clears throat> see? The the rigors of being on the yeah. road. People don't yep. know. They only see you for that 45 minutes here on stage with the cool lights and the, and the smoke. They don't know right. what it took to get there. <laughs> right. They don't know you almost died. That's right. Wow. All right. Well, hey, we survived this episode, too. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, again, uh, to everybody, if you have uh, cool stories or favorite underrated albums or films, or any other cool anecdotes that you want to share, leave them in the comments or Send us an email at askv3cast at gmail.com. Like and subscribe, and we will see you next time on V3Cast. <laughs> Somebody get me a carrot juice. Steve's Preferably dehydrated. Ice cold. <laughs> Hello. Aaron, are you rocking the wireless? No, I don't have wireless yet. Oh. I don't think you want them. I think they're over fucking rated. You got to worry Man. about them. They're tiny. It's just only this, no wire. Look how small that is. I'd fucking lose it. And then, oh, are they charged or not? Fuck that. I don't want. No, them. the Come case. On. You charge the case, and then when you put the headphones back in there, the, the case charges the headphones. That's bullshit. The dog wagging. You're talking about w walking the dog by its tail. <laughs> I don't know what you're even talking about. You're over my head. Just, the headphones. Just keep them like this. That's my look advice at, to anybody. Keep them like this. Look, it's not that big a deal. Look, Aaron. You put the headphones in there. And then you close the lid. And the, this is charged. See, there's a port on the back of it. You charge that case up. And then it... It yeah, keeps your headphones wireless charged. Wireless earbuds have to have power. But right. when you're around and you're listening to your earbuds, how are you charging the case? Who's charging? No, the you're case? not. You're not. No, the you charge the case at night or whenever you're not using them. You know, and then you then you don't ever have to worry. But so like the case the, the ca stuff because you're charging the case. This sounds like a Spinal Tap conversation. Yeah, or who's on first? <laughs> <laughs>